never ever forget the early days of my learning as a psychotherapist. I remember being in graduate school and taking like the general counseling theories class where it's like chapter one is about Freud and Freud says, here's how people think and this is how to help them change. And then Jung comes around and he says, I don't disagree, I don't agree with that. Here's how people think and here's how people change. And then Adler like came around and you know, now we're in the third chapter of the book and he says, here's how people think and here's how people change and I disagree with Freud and Jung. And I remember, and it goes on and on and on, you know, the next name, the next iteration. And I remember being a student thinking, gosh, I just wanna learn how to be a psychotherapist. And I was getting confused because each chapter was saying something different. And I kind of had the opinion that I should probably find what's current because each iteration makes the previous iteration obsolete. It's the way I was thinking of it at the time, kind of the way technology evolves, right? Like as a kid, my, my family had an eight track tape player. Um, and then one day we got a cassette player and then no one ever used eight tracks anymore because we were all using cassettes. And then CDs came out and it's like everybody got rid of their cassettes and we all had CDs. And then MP3 players came out and everybody got rid of their CDs and we all used MP3 players. And then now no one uses MP3 players because we're all streaming music. So you see like each iteration makes the previous iteration obsolete. That's how I was thinking of psychotherapy. But I realized that psychotherapy evolves very, very differently is we have to find a way of doing psychotherapy that fits with the way that you think, that you're comfortable with, and that you're able to utilize based upon your personality on what's a good fit for you in the way of talking to and working with people. That's also true in the field of solution-focused brief therapy because there is not one way of doing solution-focused brief therapy. There is uh, what, what we refer to as the Milwaukee style, like the original way that was developed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, way back when, back in um, the late 70s, early 80s, I guess. And, um, and then there are people, there's the Bruges model that was developed by a guy named Luke Isabert, the brief model developed by some really close friends of mine, Chris Harvey and Evan, uh, Chris Iveson, Harvey Ratner, and Evan George over in London. Uh, Adam Frower and I do something that we now call the diamond approach. Um, if you've been following me recently, you know what that's about. Um, and there's lots of people doing lots of iterations about solution-focused brief therapy. And a, a guy who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, a guy named Dr. Mark McCurgo, wrote a paper uh, last year, 2019, maybe 2018. Uh, the paper came out and it was about uh, calling solution-focused brief therapy version 2.0. And he was highlighting that solution-focused brief therapy is evolving and it's changing. And a lot of people in the field took that as like a disrespectful thing, like referring to 2.0 means 1.0 is obsolete. And I just want to, like, I've never said anything publicly about this, but I've heard this so much that I thought it was important that I let people know that 2.0 or 3.0 eventually or 4.0, it doesn't make the original way of doing it obsolete. It's just highlighting there are different ways of doing solution-focused brief therapy, and we're actually doing this approach a disservice by talking about solution-focused brief therapy as one entity and one way of doing things. There, There is an evolving that happens, and it actually pays homage and respect to the original ways of doing it because things evolve if they're valuable. Like I talked about technology evolving, but what that really is the evolving because we value music so much. Well, because solution-focused brief therapy is so wonderful, so many people spend a lot of time working on how to teach it, working on how to practice it, and coming up with new fresh ideas even 40 years later. And it actually honors the original work, does not devalue it. I think there are people who practice like the original way of doing it, and they, I, I think they feel threatened by all these new ways. And I, I wish that we would kind of recognize we're all working on the same thing and uh, we're all working to grow this approach and we actually honor this approach by recognizing that there's an evolution happening. We honor this approach by respecting other people's values and opinions and way of going about doing it. And we honor this approach by working together and we make this approach more um, easily learned when we are just more transparent and acknowledge there are just different ways to do this approach. And I think that that's an important thing to recognize. I think that one of the things that Mark's paper highlights so well is um, I don't think we're doing anything good by talking about it as if um, this is not happening. It is happening. Um, what Stephen and Sue 
Steve DeShazer and Sue Kimberg, the people credited with, with creating this approach. Of course, they worked with a team. Ivan, Ivan uh, uh, Alan Nunnally was there and Eve Lipchick was there and some others. But they inspired people. They inspired the next generation of therapists who came up with their own ideas and their own way of doing things. And luckily, I met some of those people. Like I talked about Chris Harvey and Evan and Linda Metcalf, who also does her version of solution-focused brief therapy. Uh, and, and these people inspired the next generation, which I'm lucky enough to be a part of. And hopefully, watching these videos will inspire you. But I want you to have new, fresh, wonderful ideas. And I want you to recognize that those ideas are valuable because when someone gets inspired to keep working on things and to evolve that thing's actually a way of showing it respect, not devaluing it. So I, I hope this video makes sense. I thought it was super important because I've never said anything publicly about this dynamic, but it's going on in the field right now. And I thought it was really important to share because I, I hope in the same way that I'm so deeply appreciative for the way that Chris, Harvey, and Evan have inspired me, and the way that Linda Metcalf has inspired me. I hope that I can inspire some other young mind, and then 30 years from now, they'll be calling what I do obsolete. I think that would be so great, because it means that you inspired people to go off and create new and, and wonderful ideas that started with something that we all see is so valuable and so true and so uh, powerful in clients' lives. So thanks for watching this video. Uh, I love it if you leave a comment because I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about this idea. If you haven't read the paper, you should go Google Mark McCurgo. Um, his paper will come up. It's a wonderful paper. It'll get you thinking. I think it's great. Leave your comments below this video. I'd love to hear what you think. Please like this video. If you're watching this video on YouTube, click the bell so you get a notification every time I post the video. If you're head on over to my website, elliotconnie.com, two L's, two T's, and get all of the stuff that I have there. Um, my website is a great resource for people who are interested in learning solution-focused brief therapy. And I will see you in the next video.